Identifying a fake Rolex can be tricky. You know, as a person who has been dealing with these things for years, when it doesn't say Swiss, you know something's wrong. John Buckley is a veteran watch dealer who buys, sells, and repairs used Rolexes. And they're sometimes worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just perfectly, perfectly done. These days, used watches can sell for up to three times their retail price. The market is estimated to be worth $20 billion, and it's growing fast. It's like everybody started buying watches. Because they're a good way to store money. Between 2011 and 2021, Rolexes outperformed the stock market, real estate, and gold. But even experienced sellers like John have to be careful. For one, there are counterfeits. U.S. Customs showed us how it seizes up to 150,000 fake watches per year. Rolex watches inside in just plain old bubble wrap. And Rolex would never put their watches in little Ziploc bags. But spotting a fake isn't always as obvious. If dealers like John get stuck with a counterfeit, the effects can be disastrous. Not just financially, but it can also destroy the reputation. New young bucks that come into the business, they get caught out there real fast. And your reputation is burned. Burned when you can't make good on a sale. Factory bezel, factory dial. We followed John through Manhattan's famous diamond district to see how he strikes deals in such a competitive market. It's 13.3. You know, it's not so bad. Of course it's not so bad. Why do you think I'm offering it to you? This section of 47th Street is home to over 2,600 businesses, selling gems, jewelry, and luxury watches. John buys and sells roughly a dozen watches per week here, from stores and other collectors. Today, he's visiting two of his regular spots. Little Eddie's got a paddock that I need. Hopefully I can buy it from him, and I'm gonna show him a couple of pieces that I've got. I gotta find it first. Oh, that's good. What's good about this watch, it, it comes fully complete. Look at the condition. You got everything? Yeah. John already has a customer lined up for this rare Patek Philippe. I really like this watch for What's myself. What's the date on the papers? I'm curious, not that it matters. He's hoping to get it for under $40,000. I, listen, I know it's, it's a nice watch. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to beat you up. You know I need it. 36,000? I thought I was pretty good at 35. 37,000, that's my final price. I think it's fair. You can think about it. I don't have to think. Mazal. No problem. You're the man. Thank, Thank you. you. This watch will be sold for 40,000 40, and change. So I'll make three grand on the watch, which is not bad. Down the street, John has his eye on a gold Rolex day date with diamonds on the bezel or the ring surrounding its glass. How much is this $21,000 watch? 25,000. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Two, three. Huh. <laughs> you like that, right? Oh Let's God, do it. Yeah, it's factory diamond dial, factory diamond bezel. 23.5. The deal, but I'm gonna do, for you, I'm gonna obviously stay yes, but. Really? It's beautiful. John typically has around 30 watches in his collection, and most already have buyers lined up. We like cash flow. I write a check, I wanna know that, you know, I'm gonna have that money back, I'll make my profit on it, and move on to the next one. It's like the holy grail over here. I didn't even think they were still producing them. He doesn't want to risk getting stuck with something he might not sell, even if he loves it. Like this diamond studded Rolex from Qatar, which has an asking price of $175,000. When you look at these that they make on the street and you compare it to something like this, I mean, it's a different world. I, I, I don't have a home for it. Despite the high price tags, John says he rarely makes more than a few thousand dollars per watch. Sometimes it's only a few hundred. There are very few home runs in this game. I mean, I don't know what is considered a home run. Making 10 grand on a watch, it's like, that doesn't happen. <laughs> thank you, Yasha no Mazal, and Good thank job. you. Thank you so much. In fact, he makes even more money selling obscure parts than the actual watches. These are interesting. These are called color change or tropical. And years ago, you know, guys would never keep this stuff. But now, because they're unique, they, they keep them and they ask for a lot of money for them. These are Daytona dials, which are actually pretty cool. This is just tons of stuff, wallets, Rolex, duffel bags and hats. 
We have it all. We do. He's hoarded these Rolex parts in his workshop for 25 years. We're here in the lab. This is where I get to uh, practice my gorilla watchmaking skills. You have to have a very specific part for a very specific watch in order for it to command a very high price. John has seen demand for Rolex parts and watches skyrocket after 2017. That's when a Rolex Daytona worn by the actor Paul Newman broke a record, selling for 15.5 million plus fees. Selling officially at 15 million 500,000. Thank you for your patience, Natalie. It is history now, 15 million 500,000. What happened after that was this big bull run, and I hate to use stock terminology, but that's what it was. It's like everybody started buying watches. In 2021, Rolex retail sales were estimated to be higher than the next five brands combined. So why are they in such high demand? First off, their reputation for quality. They're made by hand with materials like 18 karat gold, platinum, and stainless steel. And there aren't many new ones entering the market. Brands like Patek Philippe and Oldimar Piguet each make fewer than 100,000 watches per year. Rolex makes an estimated 1 million annually. And that's still not enough to keep up with demand. For most people, the only way to get one is to get one secondhand. The result of that, in many cases, is a higher demand than available supply, which causes prices to go up. Rolexes also last and can resist all kinds of extreme conditions. In fact, it started off as a sports brand back in the early 20th century. They began making highly functional timepieces designed to go underwater, top of mountains, and on jet planes. And these were professional grade timepieces for people that needed accurate measurement. These were not collectible watches back in the day, okay? You look at some of these, you know, watches that are six and seven figure watches, they sold for maybe a hundred bucks at a military PX or something like that. Edmund Hillary, one of the first to summit Everest, wore a Rolex Oyster Perpetual during his expedition in 1953. In the 60s, Rolex began sponsoring tennis matches, auto races, and a number of high-end luxury events. Rolexes also started showing up a lot more on movie screens. Actor Sean Connery wore one as James Bond. Marlon Brando wore one too. By the 1980s, Rolexes were sought after collectibles. Today, a Rolex Daytona model is so popular, it's almost impossible to get on a waiting list. I'm still on a waiting list since 1996, just to give you an idea. But buyers are willing to spend a lot to skip the line, which is why used Rolexes can sell for two to three times their retail cost. And as demand soars, watch dealers like John have to be even warier of the biggest trap of the trade, counterfeits. Customs officer Steve Nethersall showed us how they sniff out and seize counterfeit watches at JFK Airport. Before a package ever lands in the U.S., CBP gathers intelligence on the sender, container, and aircraft. He'll start by looking at the box. Well, I'm looking because I don't have my glasses on, so I'm cheating. The first, when it comes in, is the country of origin. Louis Vuitton, they're coming from France. The watch is coming from Switzerland. When it's coming from China, bing, that's your number one red flag. Rolex would never put their watches in little Ziploc bags. They don't put these inside it, the silica gel. Rolex does not send to individuals in the United States. They only send to their retail stores. More than 90% of all the goods that we receive that are counterfeit are from China. You know, sometimes by the naked eye you can't tell, but sometimes it's that bad you can. But you look and you can see the uh, scratches and how it's not machined uh, properly to a nice finish. So when Steve finds a counterfeit good, he seizes it. Then he figures out the item's MSRP, using the brand's website and CBP's internal database. This one here would be about $11,000. That's the MSRP, what the manufacturer would be losing had this been genuine. These are generally on the internet for about $200. Back in his workshop, John is figuring out whether this Rolex is counterfeit. After 25 years in the industry, he usually knows what to look for. I mean, I'm looking at the color of the case. This piece is not the same color as this piece. This is 18 karat gold. We always have to check 
because I can't take a chance on paying for it, number one, or selling it to someone else if I'm not sure. One of the most reliable ways to test gold Rolex parts is a scratch test on a black stone made of quartz. Then he adds a few drops of nitric acid, which dissolves any material that isn't gold. And there you go. Wow. The acid did not dissolve the gold. Over here, the acid dissolved the gold. It is not authentic. But most of the time, he can spot a fake with the naked eye. We could usually spot these just based on the, on the symmetry of the case. They don't have that nice Rolex slope. The other, I mean, obvious thing that you look at, if you look at the amount of space between the face and the glass, you will see that it is very high. It's probably got an extra millimeter and a half. John also has his son James help with fraud detection. And I scroll through hundreds of listings and I pick out the 10 that are fake. The threat of counterfeits hasn't stopped sellers or buyers though. Rolex is also getting in on the secondhand market, launching its own program to sell pre-owned Rolexes. Younger generations are fueling this new demand surge and they're finding out about these old watches on TikTok. I saw this watch, it's a 36 millimeter white gold with a factory diamond dial, can you pull it out for me? John's son and his friend Tyler Mikorski have helped him build a huge social media following. Buck who's with us today, let's get it. The bread and butter is the negotiations. You know, people like to see them, so we want to give people what they want. But our other thing that we really do well is more so education content. Today, we're gonna show you how to change the battery on Quartz Watch. John teaches audiences the same lessons on TikTok he showed Tyler when he was still a kid. The first time I ever sold a watch for Buckley, I was eight years old, and it was a, a rubber swatch, remember those? The rubber swatch watches. And he says, uh, I need $5 on each one. Go sell them wherever, school, wherever, and, and keep whatever's left after the five. As far as the whole hustle and the whole grind. I got that Wimbledon for you if you want it. I actually enjoy the going out there and trying to make money aspect of this business. 15-2, thank you. Despite all these new players, John isn't worried about the competition. You go by these guys who fancy themselves, you know, watch specialists, and they've been doing this for a year or two. You know, everybody's a specialist or an expert, okay? Listen, I'm a friggin' expert. I've been dealing with this stuff hand to hand. I've got the junk to prove it. Mikorski really left a cup of coffee down here? Did he really do that? That's just rude. That is just so rude.